you're doing well. This is Drew Creekmer, Wealth Advisor Creekmer Wealth, and I'm here with Andrew, another one of our Wealth Advisors in Central Illinois. And today we are having our flash briefing. Here's my cheesy shirt showing that, uh, where we're going to talk about a really relevant topic right now, and that's taxes and general tax planning. And Andrew wrote a great blog piece that kind of talks about some major pieces that you need to know as part of your retirement planning and tax planning as we move here towards the end of the tax season. So we'll hop into that. But before we do, Andrew, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, Drew. Hanging out, uh, enjoying the weather. Hopefully it doesn't rain too much today. It's uh, <laughs> We had a nice spell and now it's getting a little cold. I know. Don't you love the spring whenever it's like, oh, forget you, the sunshine is like 65, you can wear shorts and then it's like 30 degrees. Uh, three days later. Yeah, but it was the fake spring, and now we're back to uh, maybe winter. Yeah, yeah. Well, hopefully it's only a couple more weeks. But um, let's see here. So yeah, we're in spring. Obviously, I was uh, last night. I was staying up late watching basketball. And uh, have you been catching any March Madness games? Yeah, uh, Wisconsin's actually my team, but I oh. do have Arkansas actually winning the whole championship. All right. So it was a pretty good game yesterday, and we'll see if they can do it next round. I think they play right. Duke. Not so sure. they're playing Duke? Ooh. I think. I don't know. I I mean, yeah. with Duke, it's always tough because it's such a cool program. At the same time, like, it's Coach K's last year, so it's kind of, do you root for him to win it all, or you just have to hate Duke because they're like the evil empire? You have to hate Duke. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. Oh, man. Well, and didn't Wisconsin play Duke in the national championship a couple years ago? Yeah, I believe they lost. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry for old wounds. I think it was like 2015. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, cool. So let's hop into it here and uh, we'll kind of walk through it. And so we'll start with the basics. Let's start high level. So uh, we're going to use some terms today. I want to make sure that we're all on the same page. So we're going to be talking about qualified investment accounts. And so what are those? Those are accounts uh, where there are some type of tax qualifications associated with them. So for example, uh, your 401k or 403b where you work, uh, that's a qualified account. And you contribute money to that either pre-tax and you receive an income tax deduction, or you pay the taxes up front, put the money in your Roth portion of your retirement plan, and you, whenever you take the money out, you don't pay taxes. Uh, we have IRAs, Roth IRAs, those are also qualified accounts. And so we're going to be talking about those, may use those terms, so just want to make sure that you are aware of them. Uh, but one major term that a lot of folks who are approaching the age of 72 may know is a required minimum distribution. We'll call that an RMD to keep it short. And qualified accounts, especially pre-tax qualified accounts, you have to take an RMD out of that once you reach a certain age. And so, Andrew, can you run us through what is an RMD and why is it important? What are some of the issues that we see with it and how we are handling RMDs today? Yeah, so again, that required minimum distribution or RMD is just a forced withdrawal out of an IRA or a, a pre-tax account. So if you have a 401k at work, a 403b, and you roll it over to an IRA, even in the 401k, it's, you still have to make a mandatory withdrawal at the age of 72. And they previously changed that. It was 70 and a half, but they upped the age a little bit. Um, here recently so it's just a forced withdrawal you have to take out and they get that number from it's called the irs's uniform life table essentially what this is it's uh just a bunch of actuary studies where they create a life expectancy table to get you to withdraw the amount it equals out to around four to four and a half percent every year okay cool Cool. Now, what? why would the IRS come to people and say, hey, you have to take this money out of this account? Uh, a lot of clients we work with, between their Social Security, maybe they have a pension, other sources of income, uh, they actually don't need to take that much money out of their IRA. So why does the IRS force people to take this money out at a certain point in time? Yeah, so not to sound too pessimistic here, but uh, essentially they want their tax money due that they feel as owed to them. You didn't sure. pay taxes when you made the contribution into the account. You technically got the tax deferred growth over, you know, 30, 40 years. Um, they want the tax money coming back out of that on a higher amount. And essentially that's kind of why it, you, got, you have to take it out. Okay. So for individuals who either 
don't need all of their RMD or they want to reduce the amount of the RMD. How do we at Recruitment Wealth, how do we handle both of those solutions or situations? So let's start with the first one um, being, you know, hey, X, Y, and Z, they don't need their RMD. Yeah. They're living fine off their social security pension, whatever they may have. Um, you know, a lot of them come to us and say, hey, Drew, Andrew, I don't need this money. I don't want to take it. Unfortunately, you have to or you'll pay a 50% penalty on the amount that you're supposed to withdraw. Which, sure. So that's probably the best choices to take it. Um, there's a few different options. One, you can, you know, you can move it over into a taxable account and get the funds reinvested, though you will pay the taxes on that when you, you know, make the withdrawal. Um, another option is what's called a Roth conversion. But you typically have to do that before the RMD start because a Roth conversion cannot be considered an RMD. Right. So definitely think we'll hit on Roth conversion. Let's come back to that. You know, I think the first option that you talked about moving money into a taxable account, it's uh, one of the things that a lot of folks don't necessarily think about it. They say, hey, oh, I got to take this RMD. So I mean, I got to spend it or it has to go in my bank account. Well, the reality is you probably don't need all of that uh, RMD amount. You can spend some of it. That's what it's there for. It's money. It's why you work hard, right? Uh, but we strongly encourage folks to get an individual account set up, link it electronically to your IRA so we can just move money very easily between those two accounts and keep it invested and growing for you over the years. Now, Andrew, let's circle back to Roth conversions. You hit on Roth conversions. Um, and like you said, you can't do a Roth conversion to meet the RMD requirements. However, in the 10, 15, 20 years before you hit age 72, when you have to start taking those RMDs, you can do those Roth conversions. And so why would someone want to do a Roth conversion as it relates to RMDs and just overall retirement and tax planning? So, yeah, the problem with it is if you have an, you know, if you have a large IRA balance um, and you have to take that RMD and it, you know, that's going to be a substantial amount of money that's added to your income. So one of the reasons is to not push you into that next income tax bracket, which in turn could raise your Social Security, Medicare and cause more of your Social Security to be taxed. So, you know, a strategy is looking at getting it out you know, when you turn 59 and a half before this RMD period, so you don't end up in a higher tax bracket down the road, because ideally you want, you want to be in a lower tax bracket when you're in retirement, but unfortunately that's usually not the case anymore. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, let's talk just philosophically long term here about tax rates. Uh, we know that after the 2025 tax year, tax rates are going up and tax income brackets are getting narrower meaning that you're going to pay a higher tax amount on more dollars. Um, and so we know that's happening after the 2025 tax year. Uh, we also know that our country has taken out trillions and trillions of dollars of debt uh, for a variety of reasons. We won't go down that road. Uh, but with debt, you have to pay for debt. And so the government, the primary way that they generate revenue is by raising taxes and by taxing folks. And so realistically, there is a strong probability that taxes will be going up, um, even potentially more than what they are scheduled to go up here in a few years. And that's why a lot of people are saying, hey, I would like to do the Roth conversion now to pay less in taxes now than what I may in the future. Um, and But one of the things that always trips people up is the mechanics of a Roth conversion. How does it work? Uh, Andrew, can you talk to people about how you actually physically do a Roth conversion? Just walk them through the steps. Yeah, it's actually really, really simple. Um, it sounds a lot more complicated than yeah. the action actually is. I think the word conversion tricks people up and it's it's really just essentially you fill out a form and say, hey, I want to move, we'll just keep it simple, $25,000 from my IRA to my Roth IRA. And then you have the option on the form to either pay the taxes out of the conversion or send it to the IRS and then you'll get the tax bill at the end of the year. Um, there's a lot of discussion on which way is better to do it. Yeah. I technically prefer to pay the taxes out of to the IRS at the end of the year, but it's I do understand why it's much easier to pull it out of that distribution. But it's essentially just moving money from one bucket to the other bucket and uh, most firm, firms just require a form and yeah. then they do all the tax reporting for you and everything like that. Yeah. 
And, you know, one of the questions I hear a lot about Roth IRAs, I had someone actually uh, working on this exact issue with them. They said, hey, what if the government says we actually are going to change the Roth IRA rules? So the great rule with the Roth IRA is you, as long as the account's open for five years and it's been funded for that long, uh, you can pull out your contributions and your earnings and not pay income taxes on it. So, so I had someone ask me about uh, well, what happens if the Roth IRA distribution, they're going to tax the earnings. Um, I think I answer in a lot of ways it's similar to what I say about Social Security, right? We know Social Security is underfunded. Uh, the reality is that there are so many people that are making current decisions based upon their current or future potential Social Security or their current or future Roth IRA distributions. Uh, that are in the prime voting age of, let's just say, 50 plus, uh, that many politicians would be hesitant to change some of those foundational retirement rules uh, because, let's be honest, they want to get reelected. And so it doesn't mean it can't happen, definitely could, um, but that is another concern that I definitely think that we can alleviate somewhat uh, just with some rationality. And so I could almost see them putting restrictions of, you know, the required minimum distribution. And again, yeah. that doesn't count towards your income, but I don't think they would for election reasons and other reasons yeah. to make it taxable because that's the whole point of the account. But I could see them making mandatory withdrawals. So you're not just growing that up and then passing it on. For sure. For sure. So it, their rules might change somewhat, right? Like maybe Social Security goes down 10% for people who are in their 30s right now. Uh, who knows? But that's why working with a qualified financial advisor and wealth advisory firm is so important to have the ability to have that plan that's flexible that allows you to change. And so, Andrew, you mentioned something when you talked right there about uh, passing on Roth IRAs. Uh, there are some tax implications with both IRAs and Roth IRAs uh, that are different and depending upon who inherits that account. Uh, can you kind of talk to us about some things people should keep in mind uh, when it comes to beneficiaries and inheriting IRA and Roth IRA accounts? Yeah, so um, I'll try to keep it pretty high level here. But, uh, you know, if, if, if a person dies with an IRA and, you know, they, have a not, they don't have a spouse anymore, the spouse has already passed on, that IRA will typically go to their kid, kids who are usually in their highest earning years of their professional life. So what will happen is, you know, keep it simple. Jane Doe has $100,000 and it passes on yeah. to Drew. Um, and then Drew has 10 years to take that money out of, it's called an inherited IRA. He has 10 years to completely deplete the account and he doesn't have to do it all at one year. He just has 10 years to spread it out. Um, so what tax burden this creates to Drew is that this is going to add, if it's, you know, hundred thousand dollars, this could add 10, $15,000 onto his income every year, which he will owe taxes on. So, you know, that wasn't really his choice and sure he is getting, you know, more money, but that could push him into a higher bracket or mess up anything he has going on in his financial life as well. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's a big consideration. You know, I think the other consideration with IRAs, Roth IRAs, conversions, uh, is control. You know, I think ultimately you as an individual, you work so hard to save money. Um, we all know taxes are one of the eventualities of life, um, but there are things you can do to control it. And so when we think about control and financial planning, uh, to me, getting money into a Roth IRA does give you more control or moves potentially the IRS forcing you to take RMDs or forcing your beneficiaries or heirs to pay taxes that maybe they don't need to have to pay. Um, they still have to deplete that Roth IRA, but there are some tax benefits to them uh, if they don't, if the money's in the Roth IRA. So yeah, I get, the good thing about that is when the Roth IRA passes on to, you know, the child or whoever, they still have the same ten-year rule to apply that, um, but they're not going to get counted on as ordinary yeah. income, so it's not going to create a tax burden on them, and then they can essentially do whatever they want with the money yeah. and keep getting the tax-free growth. Yeah. And so, I, I mean, you think about creating a legacy that that's something to maybe keep in mind. It's probably not the most important thing in the here and now, right? It's, it's living the lifestyle you want to live when you want to. But I think it's a longer term thing to definitely be aware of. Uh, and a lot of people aren't actually when it comes to the inheriting of the IRA. And so, yeah, you just have to look at, you know, what your tax bracket is versus who the heir tax bracket yeah. is. You know, if, if you're paying 12%, why pass it on to Drew and pay 24%? Sure. That's just kind of getting less value out of the money you've saved to work for and created a legacy that you want to pass down. Absolutely. And it would make sense in that situation to get it converted over. Yeah, absolutely. Nailed it on the head there. 
So Andrew, what's the moral of the story here? What are the things that we would encourage people to keep in mind when it comes to taxes around qualified accounts? Uh, what are the maybe two or three things that should be front of mind when you're thinking through some of those longer term planning items? So, you know, if you're working with yourself, you kind of looking at taxes down the road. If you're looking, if you're working with a firm or an advisor or a financial planning firm, I think that's got to be in the front of the conversation is, hey, taxes down the road. And sure, it is hard to estimate taxes for the next yeah. 20 years down to a science. But, you know, a good plan is going to help you figure out hey, does this make sense or doesn't it make sense? And every financial planning firm will, you know, give you a straight answer of, hey, this is probably not in your best interest to do. I know we tell people that sometimes like, hey, it probably doesn't make sense. Or, yeah, this is a good idea. So I think just consulting with an advisor or, you know, if you're doing your own tax planning, being conscious of that. Yeah, absolutely. As well as things, we've been doing Roth conversions now uh, analysis for a long time. Um, and just knowing your numbers, you know, and once you know your numbers, you can make the decision that makes the most sense to you. And having that person who's done it 10, 20, 100 plus times really helps you navigate that decision making process. And so yeah. what we would encourage you to do, uh, if you don't know your numbers, if you don't know how much your current tax hook looks like, or uh, you don't have a Roth conversion or tax minimization plan, we would encourage you to reach out to our team, reach out to Andrew, reach out to Andy or myself uh, and say, hey, can you guys run my numbers for me? Uh, can you help me figure out how much I'm going to pay? And if it makes sense for me to look at some longer term tax reduction benefits, and then your advisor will be able to help you navigate that, like Andrew said. So definitely yeah, think it's beneficial. Most of the population is doing their taxes right now. So it's, uh, you know, it's already on the top of their mind. So, you know, you just grab that 1040, 1041 and you know, slide it over to us and we'll take a look. Yep. And uh, let's say someone does that, Andrew. What's the turnaround time? Let's say we get to the end of the tax season here in April. Uh, someone shoots us over their forms. How long should the expectation be before we have that analysis complete? Yeah, so I would say anywhere from, I would say two weeks max. Sure. The good thing about it is, you know, you have all year to do it for 2022. Yep. So, you know, we can get an analysis, get a baseline and then run it again towards the end of the year. Um, I guess my thoughts on it, I don't know about yours, is you can't undo these things. Yep. So, you know, back in previous rules, you could recharacterize and do that. Once you do a conversion, it's set in stone. So it usually makes sense to kind of do it towards the end of the year, in my opinion. Yep. But having a good baseline saves a lot of time um, as we go into the end of the year with R&Ds yep. and these tax conversions. Yep, absolutely. Nailed on the head. So we would definitely encourage you, shoot us over those forms, ask us to look into the numbers for you. It'll take a couple of weeks, but it's well worth the time. And we've done enough of these now to see that the majority of people do see some pretty significant uh, benefit in doing some longer term tax planning. And so definitely reach out to us. Uh, guys, if you have any other questions outside of taxes, about investments, about income planning, uh, we are here to help you in any way that we can. So don't hesitate to reach out uh, and we will help walk through things as best we can. So thanks for the time. Hope you learned a thing or two and we look forward to talking to you soon.